Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. We are back with another Learn From Home live session. My name is Rose and I am the marketing and PR coordinator here at Ocean Sonics. And I'm joined today by John Ryan. John is a senior research specialist with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Hi, John. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Rose. Good to be here. Well, for those of you who have joined us for our previous sessions, you will know that we regularly hold staff learning sessions at our office. And this is where our teammates share their expertise with the rest of our crew. And back in the spring, we rolled out our first live social media learning session as a way to stay connected and share our expertise along with the fantastic work that IC Listen users are conducting. Now, this was a great, there was such a great response to it that we decided to turn our live learning sessions into a permanent fixture. So we will be doing these live sessions every two weeks, featuring different experts from various fields in ocean research and industry, with all the focus on ocean acoustics, of course. Keep your eyes on our social media channels, and we're going to share all the details, such as upcoming topics and sessions. So if you missed any of the previous sessions, you can find them all online. We record them all live. And they live on our YouTube channel and Facebook page, so you can visit or revisit anytime you'd like. Today's session will also be recorded and shared online, so don't worry if you miss something or you want to watch it again. For everyone joining us today that's unfamiliar with Ocean Sonics, we are an ocean acoustics company and we're based in Truro, Nova Scotia on the east coast of Canada. We created the IC Listen, and this is a real-time smart hydrophone. It's a tool that's used to collect ocean sound data, and what makes it special is that this hydrophone processes data at the source and it processes it in real time. So you can actively listen and view data while the sensor is deployed. The Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, or MBARI, as it's often referred to, has been using an IC Listen smart hydrophone as part of their Mars cabled ocean observatory. And if you tuned into our previous session about ocean observatories with Jillian Duggan, you would have seen a few images of this large scale deployment. The Mars Ocean Observatory is part of the Ocean Observing Initiative, and its main purpose is to provide an easily accessible deep water facility where researchers can test equipment and also provide an opportunity for researchers to perform experiments and collect unique physical, biological, geological, and chemical data on the marine environment in the vicinity of the Mars site. The hydrophone has been part of the Mars Observatory since 2015, where it's been collecting ocean soundscape data. This is listening for living organisms, natural processes such as earthquakes, and of course, human activity. This little hydrophone produces around 24 terabytes of data annually. So John Ryan and his team at Ambari have their work cut out for them, analyzing and interpreting all of this information. And today, John is going to give us some insight into what all this acoustic data means and the changes he has observed over the first half of 2020. So again, thank you so much for joining us today, John. Thanks for that intro. Glad to be here. And so um, is it time to present anything yet? Do we go yeah, ahead and absolutely. present? absolutely. So or what we're going to do is John is going to share his screen. Um, he'll take you through his presentation. And after you're finished, John, we will have a Q&A session. So if any of you who are viewing want to know some more detail about what we cover today, just leave us a comment on our live stream and we'll be able to answer it the best that we can live after the presentation. We are monitoring all of our social media channels right now. So feel free to leave the comment on Facebook or on YouTube. So John, if you're ready, why don't you go ahead and share your screen? There it is. Are you seeing it? <clears throat> Yes, we are live. All right, Great. take it away. Great, yes. Um, as Rose introduced, we are interested in all sources of sound. In this really brief summary, I'll describe how we've been looking at quieting of the soundscape in Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary during the pandemic. This uh, opening graphic is just a map of vessel traffic from AIS. And that black dot shows the location of the Mars Cable Observatory. Mars stands for Monterey Accelerated Research System. Zooming out from Monterey Bay, um, the cable is 52 kilometers long. 
and it ends at a feature called Smooth Ridge on the Continental Slope just outside Monterey Bay and adjacent to Monterey Submarine Canyon. This is a massive canyon, largest on the U.S. West Coast. Cro a cross section is on the same scale as the Grand Canyon. So very, very fascinating place to study oceanography. And just offshore of the cabled observatory uh, are shipping lanes. Uh, hazardous cargo and, and crude oil are transported in these lanes and other cargo and uh, large vessel traffic are in these lanes, uh, northbound and southbound. This is just a location where uh, NOAA has um, environmental monitoring buoy. And we do often study wind for our oceanographic studies, the wind forcing, how that influences the ecosystem. And in the case of ocean acoustics, of course, we want to know uh, how wind is influencing the soundscape. And there's our place along the Northeast Pacific. Now here's a perspective view of the Cable Observatory uh, connecting here to Moss Landing. That's where I work. I live up here in Santa Cruz. And the main node has a total of eight ports for connecting a variety of scientific experiments. The hydrophone, the IC Listen, is one of those. Uh, in collaboration with uh, Kevin Smith and others at the Naval Postgraduate School, we've also plugged in a uh, directional hydrophone for uh, certain studies. All of my work has largely focused really on, on the IC Listen. Um, we are recording at 256 kilohertz, and that's somewhat of a compromise. We've turned it up to 512 kilohertz for a couple of weeks because Carly Merkins at NOAA wanted to determine if she could detect uh, dwarf and pygmy sperm whale clicks in our recordings, and we really needed a higher sample rate for that. Um, she did, she was able to confirm detection of these species in this region. Uh, and that's one of the great advantages of a cable. You can not only know that everything's working, but you can adjust settings for uh, different applications. But at 256 kilohertz, we've been recording for more than five years now with 96% on time. And we've gotten better at catching the uh, problems that prevent us from recording. This is the original IC Listen. And we, after two years in the deep, we replaced it with a new IC Listen. <laughs> Although the newer one had a Reson hydrophone in contrast to the original. And when we think about low frequency noise and how it may have changed during the pandemic, we, we, our interest in impacts turns to low frequency communication by baleen whales. And so here in this spectrogram, just 27 minutes, um, from 10 to 2000 Hertz, uh, humpbacks can, uh, through harmonics, it can have, uh, they can be putting energy into the ocean up to more than 20 kilohertz, but here we're focused just on uh, where most of the song energy is. And starting with the humpback, it, it is a very complex <laughs> arrangement of song units into phrases, which form themes, and a collection of themes is a song. This dashed line shows us the boundaries in time and in frequency of one song. And you can see its structure starting in the higher frequency end, dropping into the mid range and filling out the mid and low range toward the end of the song. And then that song is repeated. So there's one of our singers. Then the blue whales, um, their songs have uh, three notes, <laughs> uh, C, B, and A. The A calls are pulse trains up here, uh, just uh, near 80 hertz. And then this strongest signal here in the Blue Whale song is from the, the B call. In fact, the third harmonic fundamental is down here at the bottom, now 14 hertz. And then in between the harmonics of the Blue Whale B call are these fin whale pulse trains. And they modulate the uh, frequency of peak energy in these pulses. Uh, fascinating and, and really beautiful. Now, if we were in the same room, I would be bringing my four foot tall subwoofer and I would be treating you to a sonic massage from Blue and Fin Whale Song. But we can't do that in this format. <laughs> so 
Uh, I'm going to point you to some online re listening resources that we have. We have a live stream and a um, listening library from this IC Listen. So you can, and if you have a subwoofer at home, you can treat yourself to some uh, wall shaking, uh, inspiring sound from blues and fins. And you know, it's important to consider protection of acoustic habitat regardless, but it's particularly important when we're talking about the communication of endangered species like blue and fin whales. Uh, our noise does matter, it, it does impact their lives. So this I found, uh, I will point you to later, resources for listening, but that is a wonderful um, chorus of humpback whale song, multiple whales singing. So now let's look at another aspect of low frequency sound in this region. Again, here's our listening location just outside Monterey Bay, and here is the path of a 330 foot container vessel. I'm sorry, 330 meter. <laughs> we really got to go metric permanently. <laughs> um, and the sound recorded from that vessel is identified here, sort of within the time and frequency domain of that box, the strongest signal anyway. And this black thick line along the bottom is the time period of this transit from south to north. And you can see the dominance of this signal when it is present. There's also low frequency sound from an earthquake, from fin whale calling. This is a beautiful sequence of pulse trains. And um, we can see the wind coming up <clears throat> in the afternoon, creating a strong change. The wind increased from about two to 10 meters per second across this time period here. So this set tells us a number of things about how, how we need to analyze these recordings to quantify changes in low frequency vessel noise. We want to be kind of below the wind and of course by about 700 hertz almost half the variance in spectrum levels is is due to wind. Um, that's a separate analysis I'm not going to show but it's wind makes a big difference up here. So we don't want to be drowned by the wind and we also don't want to be biased by biological sounds when we're aiming to quantify changes in vessel noise. So the lower limit of the band that I'm gonna look at is 31 hertz, just above the fin whales. And the upper limit is about 100 hertz to be both below the wind noise, as well as to capture uh, sort of the, the upper limit of where this, um, the frequency at which this noise source is strongest. And I'm gonna dwell on the, uh, you know, avoiding bias <laughs> in the analysis for a moment. Blues and fins do put a lot of sound into the ocean and they're very active. They have a strong seasonal cycle you can see here in their calling. This song index is really just calibrated signal to noise for the strongest um, signal coming from their songs. Um, whoops, I can answer questions about that later. But what I want you to notice for right now is that the blues, blue whales have moved on. They've moved to their breeding grounds <clears throat> typically by January. We don't hear a lot of song often in January. In contrast, there's a lag for fin whales. We hear their song in January and it tapers off over the subsequent months. That's a typical pattern. And the point here is that we really want to be quantifying low frequency vessel noise above this, this fin whale band because when we're thinking about COVID impacts, it's really, uh, we're kind of starting with January of this year relative to previous years as a baseline. But, um, you know, the it was a, a trade magazine that I read in February that first indicated that we might begin to hear, we might begin to see the impacts of slowing um, ocean transportation by about February. So we want to avoid the bias from this seasonal pattern in biology. And here's that simple analysis of the winds where <clears throat> above 100 hertz, it rises steeply. This is just the percent variance explained by the linear relationship between wind speed and spectrum level. So keeping it below 100 is good for multiple reasons, and keeping it above 31 is as well. <clears throat> because not only, like for example, here's a vessel transit, and here is seismic sound. <laughs> you know, reaching all the way up to about 30 hertz. So you can see now why we place the band <clears throat> 31 to 100. 
Now, when we think about looking at changes in low frequency noise during 2020 in relation to COVID, we need a baseline. And our baseline is gonna begin in 2018. The reason for that is <clears throat> our original hydrophone had a calibration drift. At least that's what I interpret. Uh, as you can see from the beginning through uh, the middle of 2017, then we swapped it out. And there was there's no long-term trend in those low frequency noise levels. So 2018 forward gives us a good baseline to look at what was happening in 2020. And here are the primary results. Um, what you're looking at in the upper panel is a statistical summary of the spectrum levels in that frequency band, 31 to 100 hertz, for those three years, for January through July of 2018 through 2020. And what you can see, for example, um, well, let's, let's define what the statistics are. We have the gray bars mark the 10th to the 90th percentile. And the interquartile range is, is uh, between the edges of the colored box, 25th, 50th, 75th percentile. And then the geometric mean, um, averaged in dB, is shown by the white circles. So this is um, you know, a fairly thorough summary. And what you can see from, from that is uh, 2020 begins the year quite similar to 2019 and even 2018 in terms of its central tendency. Uh, and then 2020 begins to pull away, dropping below the baseline of the previous two years with the lowest uh, noise levels in June. And then by July, 2020 seems to have rebounded back to the baseline levels that were observed in 2019. And just to draw out those differences, this is simply 2020 uh, levels minus 2018 and 2019. We can see that uh, only during February through June was were the uh, noise levels in 2020 less, uh, less than uh, both of the baseline years. And by <clears throat> in both January and July, um, they're split. <laughs> so um, AIS data gives us an opportunity to examine whether these patterns in uh, sound are consistent with patterns in vessel traffic near our hydrophone. So back to our opening map, uh, we can see the two shipping lanes closer to shore, northbound apparently having more traffic than southbound. <clears throat> A lot of traffic around um, Monterey, Santa Cruz. There are three harbors here, Monterey, Santa Cruz, and Moss Landing. And we can see the transits between these harbors as well. But it's mostly this offshore area that we're interested in. Nonetheless, we've the AIS data, all of it is here, uh, quality controlled. <laughs> and what you can see right away is uh, the, the very large amount relative to other large vessel categories of, of cargo ships. And we can see them decreasing between uh, February and June. This analysis is not up to date for July yet. And the correlation between monthly um, presence of cargo vessels and monthly spectrum levels in that low frequency band is 0.92, so really strong correlation indicating that cargo vessels are the likely cause. However, there are positive correlations with these other categories as well, towing, dredging, passenger, and tanker. And the sum of these is also significantly correlated with uh, the noise levels, 0.88. So, um, you know, I understand that these, these are really brief talks, focused, so I tried to do that. And, but I must uh, also gratefully acknowledge all the people at my institute and Bari who, who make this Soundscape project possible, as well as the David and Lucille Packard Foundation who fund Ambari, and all of our collaborators um, at 
NOAA, Naval Postgraduate School, Scripps, Stanford, Hopkins, Muscle and Marine Labs, and UC Santa Cruz. And in the context of this topic, I especially want to thank uh, the Sanctuary Soundscapes project that we're, we're working with this group uh, led by Leela Hatch of NOAA, and also the AIS data. That came from the U.S. Coast Guard, and thanks to John Joseph at, at the Naval Postgraduate School. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. But well, that was fantastic. Well, first off, I have to apologize. My office phone is a web-based phone, so it decided to <laughs> ring on my computer a moment ago. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, we have, we have voicemail, so we can forget about that. Um, so let's hop right into some questions. I know I have a few. If you have a question for John about what he presented today, make sure you leave it in a comment on any of our social feeds. I am monitoring them right now, so we'll be able to answer your question live. Um, I'm going to start off with some of my questions. What was the motivation behind the Mars Ocean Observatory? And why did you feel it was important to collect round-the-clock acoustic data year after year? Yeah, so if we look at the motivation for Mars, that <clears throat> that's a bigger picture question. Uh, really, Marsha McNutt was the lead on establishing this test bed for cable observatories off Central California. And when that infrastructure was in place, I was simply talking with a friend who asked me, hey, why isn't Ambari doing more with sound? I thought that was a good question, and I proposed a simple project to install a hydrophone on the cable observatory. And I talked with the folks um, at Ocean Networks Canada, Venus and Neptune, and the Ocean Sonics hydrophone came highly recommended. So that that was that's what steered me. Actually, if anyone watching is interested in learning more about the Venus and Neptune Ocean Observatories or Ocean Observatories in general, I did mention we have had a session all about how these ca large scale cabled observatories come to be and also links to some of the listening stations. So make sure you check that out on our YouTube page. Um, so what other sensors are you using in conjunction with the hydrophones? Yeah, that's a good question. So the the hydrophone gives us perspective on, if we're focused on studying species, it gives us perspective on the, a population of that species that is vocalizing within our listening area. And that's great. We can learn a lot about the population just from that, those acoustic recordings alone. However, uh, we can learn a lot more about their lives, their ecology, and their protection if we integrate um, an ecosystem perspective. So, for example, uh, the first study I worked on was about the occurrence of humpback whale song. When does it occur here in what is considered to be primarily foraging habitat? This is where they pile on the calories so that they can head south for the breeding season. And yet, here we are in a, in a foraging habitat, and we're recording sound nine months of the year. And from year to year, the changes were huge. We, uh, the, the percent of time that we heard humpback whales singing more than doubled in a period of three years. So this was also a period of three years when the ecosystem was changing wildly. We had the so-called warm blob or mid-latitude marine heat wave, which caused a massive toxic algal bloom in our region. In fact, the Pacific Northwest was uh, impacted. It was. It resulted in the largest scale poisoning of marine mammals ever observed, and that included everything from dolphins to whales, uh, sea lions, and so. So, when you ask about other data sources, we used NASA sea level and Na uh, NOAA satellite sea surface temperature to show us how the whole California current system was changing. We used local observations that of winds that tell us how. Uh, wind forcing is affecting productivity, primary productivity, which fuels the entire food web right up to the whales. And we use measurements of primary productivity, <laughs> as well as measurements of the toxin that can cause harm to marine mammals and affect their behavior. Um, we used whale watching data. Uh, so it was, um, and a whole lot more. We used instruments in the water to tell us about what was happening. So whenever, I just like to always um, emphasize 
that these whales, these marine mammals, they're not separate from their ecosystem. So if we want to study the sounds they produce and place that in context, we really do need to understand the ecosystem. And then I know this is a long-winded answer to your question, but there's one more where we've been listening to blue whales and we can describe the seasonal patterns in their songs wonderfully. And what the hydrophone revealed to us is that as they go through their seasonal cycle and song, it peaks in November, early in the fall, they sing a lot more at night. Then later during the peak of their song, uh, they sing more evenly day and night or even more during the day. So that's a, that's a pattern we've never seen before in blue whales, but we could only explain it by looking at the individual level. So in terms of additional observations, we're working with a group, Jeremy Goldbogen's lab at Stanford, and Will Astrike is a student there doing his thesis on blue whales. And the, the IC Listen Time series was his foundation stone. Then he's putting tags on the backs of blue whales that measure their environment and their behavior. So the, the hydrophone gives us patterns at the population level of vocal behavior, whereas the tags tell us at the individual level, vocal, foraging, and migratory behavior. And so what we're hearing is a seasonal shift from a focus on foraging to a focus on migration. And we can only see that by combining the acoustics data from from the time series with individual level observations. I am really interested to hear more about that blue whale study. I, mm -hmm. I can't wait for more results to come out from that. But I also really appreciated how you mentioned that you were using whale watching um, data along with all of this very scientific and planned data. It's so nice to see the, the overlap of various industries and see how we can really support each other. Um, and I guess that ties really well into my next question, which is, has your approach to collecting ocean sound data changed since you first began? Um, if it has, uh, for instance, uh, beginning to include whale watching data, um, how has it changed and why did you choose to change that approach? Um, yes, it has. It's, it's both stayed the same and it has changed. So it stayed the same in the sense that we maintained consistent recording on the cable observatory. However, when we replaced the first hyd hydrophone with the second, and we had the second serviced and ready for action, then we could use that to deploy uh, recording um, on drifters, for example. One of our collaborators, Brandon Southall, introduced us to this method where we can get near populations of interest and target our listening. So that's one way it, it has evolved. Another way is that we've used our original IC Listen to drop down and listen to the food, <laughs> listen to the species that whales and seabirds um, feed on. And that really came from two people at my institute, Kelly Benoit Bird, who studies forage species using active acoustics, and Jared Fergurski, who's a naturalist and, uh, and also operates one of our vessels. And what they noticed is, uh, a certain seabird would duck its head underwater, come up, swim a distance, put its head under, and after a series of those occurrences, it would decide where to dive. And so the question is, how can the IC Listen, our original, be used to understand the acoustic cues that predators uh, key in on to find dense patches of prey? That is very interesting. And like the blue whale uh, study, I'm, I'm interested to hear more about this. Um, we do have a question from our YouTube channel. Um, someone would like to know if you've seen any changes in vocalizations uh, as a response to the change in shipping noise. Mm, great question. Uh, Ari Friedlander at UC Santa Cruz has just, as soon as COVID hit, he was right on it and he wrote an NSF rapid response proposal to integrate the acoustics data with uh, samples from whales. And um, the, ins the inspiring study is actually from up in your region, Rose, where the Northwest Atlantic, where 9-11 um, shut down shipping traffic completely for a time. The ocean got a lot quieter very quickly and um, North Atlantic right whales being sampled showed much lower 
stress hormone levels when the ocean got quieter. So that was sort of the inspiring original study. And Ari Friedlander is leading a project now, taking samples since March so that we can integrate acoustics data with data on stress hormone levels in the whales. It's always interesting to see when positive things spin out of negative circumstances. So it'll be interesting to see um, the data that's collected throughout 2020 as this pandemic continues. Um, but thinking a little bit about what you, what kind of data you were collecting prior to, to this major change, um, what were you hearing most in your data? Um, during, I'm sorry, could you rewind the, oh, what was I hearing most during what period? Outside of pandemic times, what what do you hear most? Um, I, I, oh, I can assume yeah. ships and vessels because that was a very busy map. Yeah, I usually have a day in the life of the Mars soundscape graphic that shows 24 hours where we see three species of singing whales, two ship transits, an earthquake, the wind coming up in the afternoon, dolphins, you know. So on any given day, it can be an incredibly diverse soundscape. Uh, of course, when the baleen whales migrate south, we don't hear them anymore. So it gets quiet in that regard. Uh, our live stream is best during the fall. Tune in September through December and you'll hear some wonderful symphonies <laughs> of baleen whale song. Um, so to be a little more quantitative though, if we look at the months during which blue whales sing, for example, the median and, and even 90th percentile of the spectrum levels are the shape of that spectrum is dominated by blue whales because they're putting that much sound energy into the ocean. Um, and so we can do these statistical characterizations that tell us, you know, you know, we can look at a spectrogram and say, I know what that is, I know what that is, I know what that is. Or we can analyze the whole time series statistically and say, that sound source is dominant. So that was one of the surprising things is how dominant blue whales are during part of the year when, when they are singing. And um, one of the really interesting things we've heard, or at least I think we've heard, we think we've heard, is a submarine landslide in Monterey Canyon. And Charlie Paul is a geologist at Ambari, and his team, together with an international group, studied how materials move down this submarine canyon, sediment in sediment flows and such. And one of their smart boulders, which was in the canyon, moved rapidly down the canyon, marking this major event. And he and his team asked if we if we heard it. And sure enough, at the time this was happening, there was this deep rumbling. And if you speed it up by a factor of 10, it sounds like rocks sliding down a hill, <laughs> but it's a very deep rumbling. Um, so, and we hear as many as I've counted as many forty as many as forty earthquakes in a day, um, and the variety of species that we hear is um, tremendous. And what we're in the process of doing is establishing effective methods for all the different species, so that we can more fully characterize biodiversity. You know, biodiversity observing networks are, are growing in importance and sound is critical to this assessment. I mean, how can we, how can we not use sound if we're gonna really understand biodiversity in a marine ecosystem? Has the, has the pandemic and the decrease in shipping made it easier for you to hear some of those more nuanced sounds? And um, has it given you a, a better idea of what's happening uh, under the surface when things aren't masked by shipping noise? Yeah, it's it's a good question. You know, I, I guess I'll put that in, in the context of detection. Where this loud vessel noise overlaps with the communication channels of, of a species, particularly the large baleen whales, if we have less of that or less intensity of that, our detection algorithms will work better. You know, there'll be the signal from the biology will be less masked by the noise. So um, another question that I have relates to um, your comment about um, wind. But does uh, the changing weather in Monterey Bay greatly affect your data? And how do you accommodate um, that that change in, say, wind, sea level, rain, uh, what have you? Yeah, good question. So, so wind is just, it can be so variable from near zero to, uh, you know, 20 knots. And so 
So quite a big range of influence on uh, the soundscape and our ability to analyze it. So an example for you is uh, humpback whale song. We started by studying the very simple question of when does it occur? Night versus day, seasonally, year to year. And then we went into how the ecosystem affected interannual variation in song. Now we want to study the structure of the song and how the structure of the song evolves in time. These are incredibly complex songs. They can go on for more than 30 minutes and be repeated or with some degree of improvisation to anthropomorphize. <laughs> but they'll go on for a day or more singing their song. They'll time their breathing so that they don't interrupt the rhythm of the song. It's really amazing. And in the literature, you find that this is described as culture and cultural transmission because a humpback whale population shares a song and yet it continuously evolves as they learn from each other and from other whales that they encounter. And so wind came into that because we're working, a couple of engineers who I work with, a few engineers who I work with, they're applying machine learning to automate the characterization of song and its evolution. And I specifically, I spent days labeling this humpback song and I chose one that had both quiet background, then the wind came up and masked the song, and then the wind went away and the song came back. So that is an ideal test case for us to see how wind affects our methods of analysis. And, um, you know, to introduce these methods to the challenge of, of, of the natural variation that occurs. Hmm. That's interesting. With the, uh, with the specific song to each, um, I guess, pod, we'll call it, are you able to differentiate if uh, you're having a re return animals or a return family versus uh, a whole new crew that's passing by within range of the hydrophone? You know, we're sort of, we're looking generally in that direction. How can we characterize um, variation in time? Your question brings up specifically another one. So let's say a popular, the Northeast Pacific population, at least the one that goes uh, to Baja, mainland Mexico, Central America, because the, the humpbacks off Alaska tend to go to Hawaii. But the ones that are off here tend to go, um, stay along the eastern margin of the North Pacific. So they're, they've got their song, they've practiced it. And by the way, we noticed that their song length increases as they move into the peak of their song season from about five minutes to 10 minutes long median song length. So my point is, it's their song is already evolving intensely while they're while they're in this region. Then they move south for the breeding season. And they're continuing to learn. So how, if the song changes uh, during the breeding season and then on their migration north, it even if we knew it was the exact same individual, their song might have changed. <laughs> so it might be hard to just key off of a song because it's continuously changing. Wonders of evolution, hey? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I wish I could remember a 30-minute song. Right. I'm lucky if I can make it to five. <laughs> um, I, have, I have a question about the graph that you showed in the changing noise levels. Um, can you, and I, I suppose that's only speculation for now, but can you speculate why the noise levels were so low in June yet rebounded significantly through July? Well, I'll tell you, I have the AIS tracking data through June. And when we get the AIS data from July, I think I can answer your question with more certainty. Um, and my prediction <laughs> is that we're going to see a rebound in cargo vessel traffic. Uh, it is the dominant category explaining the noise trend, and it makes the most sense. Um, and you know, what I've been hearing is that during July, there was there was somewhat of a stuttered restart, perhaps, of some of the ocean transportation. I need, I need more data on that. And um, we're working with a number of people who are tracking that at the federal level as well, so that we can get a, a fairly complete picture of not just the Monterey Bay region, but the whole West Coast. And even, you know, the sources of our 
um, uh, vessel traffic originating in Asia, for example. And that's, that's uh, again, Leela Hatch with NOAA is kind of leading the connection for these larger um, picture data sets on ocean noise and traffic. So speaking of ocean noise and traffic, um, with the changes that you've observed in your data over the, over the course of this pandemic, are there any that you'll hope will remain when the industries such as shipping and everything begins to return to normal? Yeah, great question. You know, you're just full of great questions. <laughs> so the, um, when we, a friend of mine, the same friend who asked me, hey, why isn't Ambari doing more with sound? Um, is when the largest container vessel to ever uh, pull into a U.S. port, it was the Benjamin Franklin, when it made its first voyage along our coast, uh, transiting from L.A. Harbor to uh, Port of Oakland, it passed right by our hydrophone. And my friend looked at that data and he could hear that massive vessel from over 100 kilometers away, well over 100 kilometers away. This is not surprising given, given low frequency noise. But my point is that one vessel transit introduced so many hopeful ideas. The first is if, it, if you have fewer larger container vessels, then you're transporting the goods you need to transport with less traffic. That right away that reduces traffic. So that's a good thing. And this ship was supposedly built to be quieter. And <laughs> so there's a lot in that, I know. Um, but it, I guess my point is my hope coming out of this COVID pandemic, and it's really an echo of what happened, you know, when vessel traffic stopped completely. I mean, sound is to marine mammals as vision is to us in a way. It's so central to every aspect of their lives, uh, communication, foraging, navigation, reproduction, avoiding predators. And our noise does have a huge impact. Shipping noise is a dominant influence, particularly on at the low frequency end and, and can affect baleen whales. So my hope is that we can be inspired to recognize. I hope more people can experience what it means to rely on sound so intensely in your life and even be inspired by listening to the incredible music created by uh, beings of the sea. <laughs> because if we, we can't, care if we're not aware. And when I bring my sound system to an audience and people feel the vibration of a blue whale, they get touched, they get emotional, they get interested in conservation. And so my hope for the industry would be, hey, let's, let's recognize that this is a real problem and let's use the best engineering we have to minimize noise from this source because it's going to help conservation of endangered species. It's going to help our stewardship of life on earth. And that is inspiring, I think. I, I almost wish you could go back to, you know, cherry pick things from the 70s that we like, like whale songs being so in vogue, you know, yeah. where we everybody has a cassette or a, a record, I guess, in, in their deck that has these soothing whale songs and we can all just enjoy them again. But I do anyway. <laughs> right. So one last question I have for you, and this one's a little bit pie in the sky. So feel free to get um, as as optimistic and hopeful as you can about it. But what do you want to see in the coming years as far as your acoustic programming goes? Uh, yeah, in the coming years, you know, I, I kind of go to our relationship with the National Marine Sanctuaries Program, right? I love doing science. I love doing research. I love studying life, <laughs> but it's really um, important to direct the science where it can have an impact, where it can inform our decisions about how we manage natural resources. And from the beginning, we've had a great uh, relationship with Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, their research group and their advisory council. And so, for example, one of the first studies we did on noise concerned explosions in used in explosives used in fishing operations and you know the ocean surface is a tremendous muffler so if you throw an explosive off the deck of your boat you're just going to hear a muffled poof but in fact uh, model 
acoustic modeling efforts by the Naval Postgraduate School show us these the noise, intense noise from these explosions travels tens of kilometers. It even refracts down into the bottom of Monterey Submarine Canyon after being ignited up on the shelf near the coast. So it's a huge impact. And simply by raising awareness that this noise source existed in our sanctuary, it gives us the opportunity to bring all the stakeholders together, the fishers, the resource managers, the scientists, the nonprofits, so that we can raise awareness so that everybody understands the nature of the problem. Otherwise, it's really hard to understand and to recognize how we can do better. And we're really good at finding better ways once we know a better way is needed. So my pie in the sky kind of does begin locally, but it, it expands at least nationally to the, the Sanctuary Soundscapes project, comparing soundscapes around uh, around the the U.S. and then of course you know there are many efforts going on around the world with these intentions, the International Quiet Ocean Project, et, et cetera. So I'm I'm just um, you know my pie in the sky is is that this community of acousticians using excellent methods of recording and analyzing sound can create a clear picture to inform resource management in a way that is beneficial. Um, to nature, beneficial to conservation, and ultimately beneficial to people. Because if you put a challenge out there, make that ship quieter, you got to hire some engineers to maybe to help you do that. There's, I see, I see, uh, you know, economic gain in all this. <laughs> Well, for everybody who isn't a whale hugger, economic gain will always be like that trigger. Word. <laughs> like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> so those are all the questions that we have for now. Again, thank you so much for joining us today, John. If there's a question that you didn't get to ask or if there's a topic that you want to see covered during this live series, please contact me by sending Ocean Sonics a message or you can always drop us a line on our social media channels. John and his team at Embari can be found through their website, embari.org, or on their social media channels. You can check out their listening library through their website if you'd like to hear some of the recordings that we spoke about today. And if you want to revisit this presentation, it will be available on YouTube and on Facebook, and I will share the link through the Ocean Sonic social media channels. John, is there any parting words that you'd like to leave us with today? Um, listen to whales. <laughs> and thank you, Rose. Uh, thank you, Ocean Sonics. We've really, really appreciated working with. Step into the ocean soundscape. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. And hopefully we'll see you soon for another live session.